Hello and welcome. One of the big concerns in 2024 is the impact that generative artificial intelligence will have on the future of employment, the nature of work and what consequences this could have for a country like India. Joining us now at the India Today Business Today studios at the World Economic Forum at Davos is one of the world's most renowned economists, the first Deputy Managing Director of the International Monetary Fund, Dr. Geeta Gopina. Thank you so much, ma'am, for your time and welcome back. Hi, Rahul. So the join you. IMF has come out with a report which looks at the impact generative artificial intelligence has on workplaces, the nature of employment and uh, the future of work. Do you want to talk us through uh, what this means for India's young working age population and how this could change working in the way that we know it? Yeah. So Rahul, let me uh, start with the global impact that we expect uh, in terms of jobs from uh, generative AI. Our estimate is that about 40% of jobs globally are vulnerable to 40%. 40%. Now, vulnerable doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad thing because some of those jobs you're exposed to AI, but in a positive way, which means that it increases your productivity. But then you could have the other kind of exposure where it actually, you know, you get displaced. So if we do that breakdown, then it's about half and half. Now, there's a lot of variation. So if you look at the US, we have about a 60% exposure. About 30% of that was complementing the worker, and 30% is not complementing the worker. If you look at India, because there's a very large number of workers who are in the agricultural sector, the exposure is lower at around 30%. So in a sense, India doesn't have the negative effect, widespread effect on the labor market, the potential negative effect on the labor market, but it also is then missing out on the positive effect of AI. So that's kind of the broad scope that we have. But usually when it came to say robotics or automation, the impact was on workers who were not very high up the skill pyramid. Now we're seeing a lot of what was previously considered very high end uh, work. I was at a session on Gen AI in the morning at the web center and a lot of say coding now can simply be done through generative artificial intelligence. You've got a young son. How do, how do people who about to hit the working age population really deal with these changes and prepare to have a meaningful career and a meaningful life going forward. It's certainly the case that this is now replacing you know cognitive uh, skills which is a more ritual kind of more uh, you know automatic kind of cognitive work. It is affecting the top end of the spectrum too. Actually it may be benefiting the less experienced workers because the less experienced workers are able to use Gen AI to kind of build up experience very quickly because of the technology being able to aggregate whatever learning there is that you get from experience. So it benefits you if you have less experience. You're, if you're kind of middling uh, in the management scale, then it has some somewhat, somewhat of a negative effect on you. At the very end, of course, the very, very best are going to benefit from this uh, this technology it complements them the most but right below that you might start seeing a, a negative effect now what we also notice is that those at the very end in terms of skill labor income skill and high incomes also tend to get capital income and here's where the source of inequality can be the biggest because we might see a lot more concentration of wealth at least we're already seeing it in terms of where all the ai is getting developed and produced it's in a few in a number of companies and in a couple of countries, it's basically the U.S. and in China. That's where most of the development is happening. So what are you telling your son in terms of preparing for a workforce in the future, of jobs in the future, where a lot of work can be done through generative AI and the rest through robotics and automation? You know, I mean, first thing, young people have the advantage of being much faster in picking up new technology. Sure. Right? And so what I'm telling him is that he's obviously in college right now, so he's in a good place to learn the AI tools that can raise his productivity. I think the problem, of course, is for the older people who are usually not that savvy about picking up new technology. And there's where the risks would happen. So one of the consequences you asked about the impact on India is, I would say, specifically on call centers. Right? That is the one industry that could very quickly be you know, driven out of business because of AI. And you would not see the kind of outsourcing of work that goes from the US to India through the call center. There is where you might see very quick effects, and, that, and that's one of the areas that one has to pay attention and to. As far as countries are concerned, which countries are likely to be the beneficiaries of this, or which are likely to be the biggest losers? Or do you think it's difficult to classify as far as countries are concerned? It's more down to individuals and companies. Right. So what, we know that countries 
that have a high level of human capital, great innovation space, good digital infrastructure, and the right kinds of regulation are going to benefit from it. So who are these countries? We actually did a, what we call a country preparedness index for AI. Among the top, you have the US, you have Singapore, you have Denmark, you have Germany. India is about the average for emerging markets, kind of in the middle of the pack. But the countries that are going to benefit from it are the ones who are at the up top end in terms of all of these uh, indicators. Let's come to growth. Now, we'll start with India. There's a big debate raging at this moment about the kind of uh, economic recovery India is seeing. Government-leaning economists say this is not K-shaped. A lot of left-leaning economists and don't attribute any ideology to the numbers that different people are doing, but they're insisting that we're seeing a very in equal, unequal uh, economic recovery where the rich are becoming richer at the top of the K and the poor are becoming poorer. What's your individual and institutional reading? I mean, at first, I think we should recognize that uh, the Indian economy is doing well. If you look at major economies, it remains one of the fastest growing economies, and, I, and we expect that will be true even in 2024. Two big areas of huge progress have been physical infrastructure, you know, roads, ports, airports, and so on, but also digital infrastructure. I think both of those have been areas of remarkable progress, and that is beneficial to everybody. I mean, it's not just the very rich, it affects all parts of society. We're also seeing consumption growth, you know, to be uh, doing quite well, though we expect it to slow uh, going forward. Yes, the government's public investment push has played a very important role. But again, I think India needs also much more reforms for it to be able to truly realize its potential and make sure that everybody, including youth unemployment, is reduced, you know, that you know, concerns about the K-shaped recovery are addressed. In terms of specific reforms, for instance, financial uh, access to medium, small, and micro enterprises, I think is still an area where, we, where more work is needed, like credit growth to that particular sector. More is needed on that front. Labor market reforms are needed. Female labor force participation is incredibly low. More needs to be done to, to bring that up. So, I mean, there are many areas of... Reform. So is the recovery K-shaped or not, in your view? Well, it is, you, you know, it is an economy where there, are, there is overall growth that is make, improving livelihoods for a large number of people. But at the same time, yes, you do see uh, that what also typically tends to happen, that in these intermediate phases of growth, that you see more happening faster at the top end. Okay, so there is, in some senses, enough data for you to suggest that the recovery is indeed K-shaped. I would not, no, I would not say that there's enough data for that, because actually, by the way, that is one area where more progress would be very helpful, is to have a lot more data collected at uh, a high enough frequency in India. Uh, if you look at employment numbers and so on, you know, there are still debates on the, on the quality of those numbers, so more data is required. I think the headline story is that India, India's growth is a good one. Uh, it is one of the fastest growing economies of the world. But I would also add that it needs to keep up consistent reforms. So let's come, because you've mentioned reforms twice over. Uh, the Indian government's heading into election mode, so no reform is likely just in the next few weeks and months. But after that, what are the key reforms that you think the Indian state should be undertaking to step up uh, the growth process and to make growth more equitable for all our people? In terms of reforms, this is required not just at the national level, but at the state government level too, because of all these different subjects, of course, are handled at both uh, levels of government. Firstly, continue the good investment that's being done in public infrastructure, including digital public infrastructure. Obviously, that's not done. Much more is needed. Continue that good work. It's shown to bring in a lot more uh, activity, catalyze a lot more activity. Labor market reforms is important, and I said on female labor force participation, that's important. Credit to MSMEs, an important area. Land reforms are also critical. Agricultural sector reforms, these are unfinished But all businesses. these are political hot potatoes. Each time the government tries to touch them, there's a big uh, pushback from the farms or from the street, and that makes it very difficult for any government. That is how it is, but that's what will be needed progress on those fronts will be needed to, to kind of get the story to another whole level. When it comes to China, uh, you spoke of the need for more data. I mean, that's uh, into two or more in China. What's your reading of just how badly the Chinese economy is doing at this moment? Well, um, firstly, 
we upgraded China's growth forecast in November. It did better than we were expecting in the second half of this year. Uh, we have growth at 5.4 percent for China, and we're next year is about 4.6 percent. I think the main challenges China faces, one is in the property sector, which is a, an important part of China's economy. It's still in a weak state. And the second is on local government finances and, you know, the financial, uh, the exposures local government financing vehicles have, right? So that's another area. I think those two are going to be critical to address if you, re if, you know, you, can, you want to get consumer sentiment back to the positive territory. The government is moving on these fronts. They have put some more stimulus in place, and that's why we, one of the reasons why we upgraded. But it is true that if you look outwards and we look into our medium-term forecast, we have growth at five is out at about three and a half percent for for China. So it is projected to come down. In addition to the two factors I mentioned, it's of course the aging demographics and weak productivity growth in China. But there are reforms again. In the case of China, there are reforms that can absolutely change that story, and more market-based uh, reforms would be very helpful. In your economic models, is it now seeming almost certain that there is no scenario where China could overtake the United States at some point in time in the future? Well, it, it depends upon how you measure the, uh, you know, whether you use, use PPP-based statistics or market exchange rate-based statistics. So, you know, we are not really paying that close attention to who's overtaking who at this point. In terms of per capita income, of course, China still has a long way to go to get to the levels of uh, uh, the U.S., and that's where they should be focused on. Which are the countries which are of the maximum concern to you? When you look at the world, especially in India's neighborhood, what concerns you the most, Dr. Gopina? No, I think if you're, uh, for low-income countries, I'm going to step back out of the, in, uh, the neighborhood of India, but low-income countries have been struggling for the past three to four years. Their debt levels are either already in distress levels or they are doing debt restructuring. And while emerging markets otherwise, in major emerging market economies like India, have actually done fine these past three, four years, despite interest rates going up so much in the U.S., low-income countries have been shut out of these markets. So that's a part of the world that we're paying uh, close attention to and you know, where the risks are quite high. In India's neighborhood, Pakistan, Sri Lanka have been massive areas of concern. So we have programs both with uh, Sri Lanka and with Pakistan. In the case of, in the case of Sri Lanka, we just had a review, and, you know, there are, there's lots of good news coming out of there. Inflation has come down quite a lot. We're seeing the recovery. We expect growth to come back up. Positive signs over there. Pakistan, actually, the caretaker government also, we believe, have done, has done a good job in terms of stabilizing the economy, but they have, have was elections coming up. So we'll see once the next government comes, you know, what And that before we like. wrap up, since we're running out of time, uh, I was seeing that the IMF's estimate for India's growth for this fiscal is 6.3. The RBI's own initial estimates seem to suggest 7.4. So what is it that you're picking up, which is 1% different from what the RBI and the government's own estimate seems to be? So firstly, we are putting out our January update uh, towards the end of this so you'll be revising it month, upwards? and we are in the process of revising up for uh, Does for it India. catch up to 7.4 or not really? That you will have to wait and see. I think it had a good, very strong first half of fiscal year 23-24. For the second half, we are seeing more slowing. I mean, that's not unexpected given that there was much more front-loading of public investment and we're also seeing some softening in, cons in consumer spending. But we will be revising up and you will see the numbers. Okay, it's uh, been interesting talking to you. It's also good that you've right at the end given the sense that there will be an upward revision in the IMF's growth prospects. So you'll come closer towards uh, 7.4 or wherever your numbers ultimately land up. We wish you all the best. I hope you have a great week. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Rahul, and I hope you enjoy Davos. It's been really nice. Thank you. What about you? Have you been out and about? The sun is up. It's looking lovely. Or have you just been, uh, your mind is just taking you from one meeting to the next? I'm, I unfortunately, I have a packed schedule. So, no, but I'm, I'm like, I like seeing this. You have a nice background. Yeah, yeah you should go out. The sun is up, <laughs> and it's lovely. It's the best time to be out. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Darwin Platform Group of Companies is one of the fastest growing diversified Indian conglomerates with global footprints. It is setting up offices globally and tying up with companies across the globe for multiple sectors.
The company has ventured into real estate and construction, stock broking and finance, arms and ammunitions, mining, airlines and many other sectors.